Let us pray. Almighty God, we're asking that you speak to our hearts from your word this very day in Jesus' name. And we pray that you'll grant us the power, the ability, so that we'll be able to do your will. And we'll be able to live lives that bring glory unto your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Today I want to talk to you and read the Bible with you concerning the subject of practical holiness. Every sincere believer and every student of the Bible will know that holiness is very important. And the Bible in many places and many passages talks about such an important subject of practical holiness. The question that may come up in your mind is, why is practical holiness so very important? For a number of reasons. One, the voice of God in Scripture plainly commands it. Two, the great purpose for which Christ came into this world is that we might be essentially holy and to live lives that will bring glory to the name of the Lord. Three, practical holiness is the proof that we love Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in all sincerity. Number four, without holiness on earth, we shall never be prepared to enjoy heaven when we have left this place. Let's look at these three things as the giving to us from Scripture. That the voice of God in the Scriptures plainly commands that we live lives that are holy. First Peter chapter 1 from verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the law, the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Here God himself speaks to his own children, that his children should be different from what they were before they became God's children. And we should be different from the people that as yet have not known the Lord in the experience of being born again. And that as God, who has called us, is a holy God, a righteous God, a pure God, so should we, in all manner of conversation, be holy, be righteous, and be pure. Then it emphasizes, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The voice of God commands it. The children of God will listen to the voice of God. They will pray until they obtain the grace from the Lord to be holy. Number two, the great purpose, the great reason for which Jesus Christ came into this world, for which he suffered, for which he offered and sacrificed himself, is that you and I, after we have become children of God, should be holy. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. The reason Christ came, the reason Christ suffered, the reason he sacrificed and paid such a penalty on the cross is that he will take you and I and redeem every one of us from all kinds of iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, a separated people, a different people that will be zealous not of evil works, that will be zealous 
not in committing sin, that will be zealous of good works. In Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it, for the church. What's the purpose? That he might sanctify and cleanse it, or the washing of water by the word. Is that the end that he might present that church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I told you, number three, when you have practical holiness of life, that is the proof that to actually love the Lord Jesus Christ who has done so much for you, you love him in all sincerity. John chapter 14, verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. When you are keeping the commandments of the Lord, that's holiness. When you walk in all the ways of the Lord, that's holiness. And then I said, without this practical holiness on earth, we shall never be prepared to enjoy heaven after we have left here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. It says, nothing defiling, nothing sinful, nothing that still has the nature of corruption, of defilement, will ever get into the city of God, the eternal city. But only those people who have been cleansed, who have been purified, whose lives have become spotless, they are the people that will enter into that city. In Psalm 15. I'm reading there from verse 1. The king, David, the psalmist of Israel, Ask the Lord what it will take, what it will require to make it to heaven at last. And here is the question as well as the answer. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Or who shall dwell in thy holy hill? The answer, he that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own heart, and changeth not, that is, he makes a commitment to Almighty God. He makes a consecration to Almighty God. He yields himself and lays himself upon the altar. And he says, I yield my all to the Lord. And even though circumstances change, even though persecution may come, he, has, he will not change. He putteth not forth out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. doesn't have anything to do with taking bribes or giving bribes. He that doeth these things, shall never be moved. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands. Clean hands. is not shedding blood. is not taking bribe. is not working out any iniquity. is not practicing anything that is sinful. Clean hands. 
and a pure heart. Pure heart, pure motive, pure affection, pure love, pure thought. Who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully? You can see that the subject of practical holiness is so very important. Important for you if you are obedient to the voice of God. Important for you if the great purpose of Christ will be fulfilled in your life. The reason he came. Important for you if you want to show an evidence that you love Jesus the Lord in all sincerity. Important if you want to make heaven your home at last. And look at two things. One, the presence of practical holiness. Persons, that is people, that lived lives of practical holiness. Number two, the pictures of practical holiness. The persons or the people of practical holiness and the pictures of practical holiness. Can we find people in Bible days that lived in the same way we are living today, but then in their own world, at their own time, they got grace from the Lord and they lived, they lived lives of practical holiness? If we can get at such people, our confidence is this, that the same God who helped them that same God is able to help us. God has not changed. His grace remains the same. The blood that cleansed those days, that blood has not run dry. And if the blood of Jesus, the blood of the acceptable sacrifice, cleansed them, purified them, and purged them, that same blood is still able to cleanse us today. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Paul the Apostle said that he, by the grace of God, together with the people that were with him, they lived holily, justly, unblameably. God was witness that their motives were pure, their hearts were pure. The people themselves were witness or witnesses that their hands were clean. The people testified and witnessed to the outward purity, and God witnessed to the inward purity. In Ezekiel chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, says the Lord God. God himself testified that Job was righteous. He even told the devil, Have you seen my servant Job? That is righteous, is perfect. Of all the people that lived at that time, he hates evil. And also about Daniel. Innocency was found in the heart, in the life, in the hand of Daniel. Concerning Noah, he lived a just life, and he walked with God. I'm showing you all these examples so that you will know that if God helps them, God can help us. There are many people we can point to in the Bible that were people of practical holiness, or persons of practical holiness, but have selected some. The people have selected I selected them because of the evidence of practical holiness in their lives. Not only that, I selected them because it will help you to remember the way they have been selected. Their names begin with the letters of the word holiness. 
So you write the word holiness and we take the letters one by one. And we see people whose names begin with the letters of the word holiness. The first one is Ezekiah in Second Kings. Second Kings chapter 20 from verse 1. In those days was Ezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos came to him and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Ezekiah wept so. And it came to pass before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again, and tell Ezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. Ezekiah said before the Lord, O Lord, remember me. Remember now how I walked before you. He walked in truth. What is holiness? Walking in the truth every day of your life. Not walking according to the principles of this world, but walking according to the truth of the word of God you have learned. Basically, that is holiness. He said, O Lord, remember how I have walked before you with a perfect heart. Lord, you know that my motives were right. You saw the thoughts of my heart. And you saw that my heart was pure and perfect. And he said, remember what I've done. I've always done good in your presence. I've never deviated, doing evil, following after vain people. I have done good deeds in your sight. This man also trusted in the Lord. When the prophet came and said, you will die, set your house in order. He faced the wall and he prayed unto the Lord. What's holiness? When you so trust the Lord, that in all circumstances, he will see you through. His promises will not fail you. And then a person that is holy will be prayerful. And he worship the Lord. After the Lord healed him, he didn't say, well, now I've got my healing. Let me now be at liberty and live a loose life. He kept on trusting in the Lord. Worshipping in God's house. So then, we learn from the practical life of Hezekiah that when we're holy, it means simply that we're walking in the truth. We're walking in the truth of the doctrines of the Bible. We're not walking according to false doctrine, according to error. Let's look at the next person. His name is Obadiah. First Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18 from verse 3. And he have called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Obadiah lived in a community, in an environment of idolatry. All around him, Jezebel worshipped Baal. But Obadiah feared the Lord not just moderately, he feared the Lord greatly. Whenever any idolatrous practice was going on in the palace of Ahab, the fear of the Lord will come, out, will come up in the heart of Obadiah. And he will say, should I do this? What will God think about this? How will God view this? He walked soberly before the Lord, gently before the Lord, humbly before the Lord, fearfully before the Lord. And we're told in verse 4, For it was so, when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took an hundred prophets, and hid them by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water. He respected, he loved, and he cared for the people of God so much, that he 
made his life to come into jeopardy because if Jezebel had discovered that, he might have lost his job. As a governor, even though he was a governor, he still went the way of the Lord and he cared for the people of God. Out of his own substance, what is holiness? When you are in disagreement with the idolatrous practice of the community, with the sinful policies of your community, and you will not go along with the evil ways and the evil tendencies of the community, and wholeheartedly you fear the Lord, because you look beyond your life in the palace. You look beyond your life in the secretariat. You look beyond your life in the place where you are working, maybe as a governor, maybe as a king, maybe as a ruler, maybe as a manager, and you fear the Lord all the time. And even though um, Jezebel or Ahab may be going the wrong way, you faithfully carry out your duty without following their sinful practices with them. Then in verse 7, As Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face, and said, Art thou that my lord Elijah? See the respect, and see the honor. Ahab was looking for Elijah to kill Elijah, but Obadiah was of another heart. You know what a holy man is? A holy man is of another spirit. From the people of the world. Another heart from the people of the world. He fell down before Elijah and said, Are you my Lord Elijah? My master Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go tell thy Lord. Behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned? That thou shouldest deliver, wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me. As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord has not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou seest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is there. And it shall, it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee, whither I know not. So when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Even though he was living with somebody and walking with somebody that could even kill him for worshipping the Lord, he had the wisdom of God, and he patiently followed after the Lord, and he still feared the Lord greatly. And so we learn that if we have holiness of heart and holiness of life, like Obadiah, will fear God. No matter what people around us do, we fear God. We'll care for God's people. We'll be friendly to God's people. And we'll honor the servant of the Lord. We'll believe in God. We'll be faithful and loyal at work. Even though Ahab was bad, he did his work loyally. Ahab said, you go to that side and seek something for the animal to take. Well, he said, that's my job said that's secular, I'll do that. I'll do my job faithfully and loyally, and yet I'll fear God. L, the Levites. I want you to look at Exodus chapter 32, verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. The nation, again, had gone astray. And Moses wanted to know who will swim against the tide. Who will walk against the trend of the nation. Who will live contrary to the principles of the society around them. And the Levites, a picture of holy people. Those Levites came out and they said, whatever the rest of the people are doing, we're on the Lord's side. A holy man is on the Lord's side. A holy woman is on the Lord's side. All the other people will be going the wrong direction. The one that is holy will say, I will go the direction of the Lord. I will swim against the tide. I will walk contrary to the principles that are worldly. I'll be renewed in my mind. I will not be conformed to the principles and the precepts of this world. That's holiness. In Numbers 
chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And I, behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel, instead of the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. A person that is holy is totally separated and consecrated unto the Lord. Morning, noon, and night. Every day, every week, every month of the year. All the years of his life, he says, Lord, I belong to you. That's holiness. A person that has so separated himself, so consecrated himself, that God can say, he's totally mine. His past is in my hand. His future, in my hand. His present life is so totally available to me. He is mine. I can use him wherever I want. I can send him wherever I want. I can make him to do my perfect will. Because he will do my will willingly, wholeheartedly. He's totally mine. I can reveal my mind to him. Because what I reveal to him, he will carry out. That's holiness. Look at Numbers chapter 5. Numbers chapter 5. From verse 5. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. Numbers chapter 8, from verse 5. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. You know, holy people, they are cleansed people. Those who are washed, those who are cleansed, those who are purified, and so are the Levites. And they picture for us real holiness. And then it says in verse 11, and Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering of the children of Israel, that they may execute the service of the Lord. It says, you offer those Levites, you give them to the Lord. Their hearts, their lives, their hands, their mouths, their ears, their head, everything they had, everything is now offered to the Lord. Their hands are not to serve the devil. Their mouths will not speak of the world. They will speak and they will talk of only things concerning the Lord. They will do things with God present all the time. They are conscious of the presence of the Lord. That's holiness. When your hand, your mouth, your ears, your eyes, every part of you, when everything has been totally consecrated and offered to the Lord, that the only thing that you do now is just for the glory of God alone. Verse 14, And thou shalt, thou shalt thou separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. Verse 19, And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and to his sons from among the children of Israel to do service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of congregation and to make an atonement for the children of Israel, that there be no plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel come near unto the sanctuary. So then people that are holy are consecrated to God. They are always on the Lord's side against the rebels. They have yielded service that they offer to the Lord. They are available as gift to Christ and as gift to the church. And they are not greedy of earthly gain or earthly position like the Levites. The next person I want to show you is called Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6, from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his strength filled the temple. And then in verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thy iniquity is taken away. Thy sin is purged. He saw the glory of the Lord. He saw the beauty of holiness in God. And he said, even though I'm a prophet, even though I know God, even though I've been saved, 
even though I've turned away from all outward sin, yet now that I saw the glory of God, I feel so unclean. The stars are not clean in his sight, neither the moon, how much less the sons of men. And I cried out and I said, Woe is me, what shall I do? Then the angel flew to his side and touched his lips with the sanctifying fire, with the purifying coal of fire. And he said, This has touched you. It's coming from God's altar. It's coming from heaven itself. Your sin is taken away. And all your iniquity, everything has been taken away and totally purged. Then I also heard the voice, the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And who wake up for us? And he said, Oh, uh, here am I. Send me. Now he was weak because he had been cleansed. He had been purged. He had been purified. And willing service will always come out talking about the people that are willing. The next person is Noah. In Genesis chapter 6. I mean in verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. And perfect in his generation. And Noah was with God. And he was a preacher of righteousness. He walked with God. Chapter 7 verse 5. And Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. That's what yes. When a man has a perfect heart. When his dealings with his fellow men are just. When he's working with God in agreement with all the doctrines of the Bible, and when everything that he had has commanded, all the known commandments that he has been knowledge or he has been totally obedient to it. What is that? That's holiness. And so Noah was like her. The next second is Enoch. And Genesis chapter 5, from verse 22. And Enoch worked with God after he got made to Salem. 300 years, and he got sons and daughters. And how old the days of Enoch was 365 years, and Enoch walked with God. And it was not for God to him. And to work together, except to be a great, he was in complete fellowship and broken fellowship with God. No sin came to break his fellowship. No hypocrisy came in to break his fellowship with God. No iniquity came in to make him feel guilty for the Lord. He walked in complete fellowship and total agreement with God's word. He was so holy. So kill, not to kill away. The next person is Samuel. E. For Samuel. Chapter 12. For Samuel. Chapter 12. Let's look at. That's true. Behold. Fire. Witness against me before the Lord and before it anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose ox have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Of course, once I received any brighter blind, my eyes stay away. And I went to it. And he said, Thou hast defrauded, thou hast not defrauded us. Thou oppressed us. Neither has that taken out a penny in my hand. That man was holy. The next man is TV. Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 7. Acts. Chapter 7. That's 15. And the stone stayed. Calling upon God and saying, Lord, Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this thing to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He was of good report among the brethren and among the unbelievers. That's why they chased him to be among the seven. But then, when great persecution came to the point that they were even killing him, he had forgiveness, he had forbearance, he had love. In fact, he paid for his sins like Christ. What is holiness? Holiness is being like Christ. Forgiving like Christ. Forgiving like Christ. Loving like Christ. And so we find that there are these people, Hezekiah, Obadiah, the Levites, Isaiah, Noah, Enoch, Samuel, and Stephen. That the Lord himself helps them to live holy lives. And God testified about them. And the people around them testified about them. That they lived lives that were holy and righteous before the Lord. The same grace is still available today. If it was possible for them, I believe it is possible for every one of us in Jesus' name. Now I go to the pictures of practical holiness. It is so important that your portion know what makes up holiness. What constitutes holiness. And God's word is very clear on the details and the characteristics of Bible practical holiness. Simply stated, the following virtues I talk about now, they are included in holiness. Again, I use the letters of the word holiness. If a man is holy, there are the humility in his life. You can't talk of holiness and talk about pride. I can see. You can't talk of holiness and talk about being haughty. 
If you are talking about holiness, yes, you need that that man, that woman, has got the grace of God. Yes. They call humble to you know, her obedience. This obedience does not go like holiness. If I say that, what is it? Yes, that is a uh, preach obedience to the world of God. Yeah? But now, if I holy, my Lord, I am not full of bitterness, hatred, and evil, and wickedness, I will say, well, I am no evil, so live so hard now. I, or, you say, the man that is innocent. The sin they are running in his community is innocent of it. The community of daughter of fornication in his community is innocent of it because he is a holy child of God. And what a new life. His life is totally different now. He has risen out and is living in newness of life. He will find endurance. There is an against him. He can endure. He will endure hardship. He will endure affliction. He will endure persecution. And you never hear evil from his mouth. As a self denier. He doesn't go the way of sir. He has crucified sir. And sir is completely dead and buried. Another is for separation. Separation from sin. Separation from pollution. Separation from the world. Let's look at them. In first Peter chapter five. I'm reading as far. Like what's a younger? Submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye all of you, whether old or young, elders or the subordinate. All of you, be subject one to another, be clothed completely covered with humility, for God insists the pride and giveth grace to the humble. This heart is so parched and so cleansed that it manifests humility. Any person that is humble will have kind temper, will have meekness, gentleness, lowliness. Towards all men, he will be patient in all circumstances. And he will have long suffering. And he will not utter anything out of his mouth because he cannot control his tongue. Humility bridles his tongue. Such a poor man or woman, obviously humble. And such humility, such lowliness of mind, will make him to esteem others better than himself. Like Abraham, he will say, I am only dust and ashes. Like Jacob, he will testify, O oh Lord, I am less than all the mercies that you have given to me. Like Paul, the apostle, he will say, Even though I have done everything I have done by the grace of God, I am less than the least of the saints. He will not be the person that is parading his ability, his gifts, a person that is on other people and telling other people how great he is, a man that is humble. I will say, Everything I do, I do only by the grace of God. I told you that holiness includes obedience to the word of God. Psalm 119. Verse 60. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. Someone whose heart has been made holy will be obedient to God's word. The moment you hear God's word that concerns any matter in your life, very, very quickly, promptly, you are obedient to the word of God. That's the essence of holiness. Holiness is not just going about, frowning the face without talking, walking slowly. That's not holiness. Holiness is obedience to the word of God. Is there any doctrine the Bible teaches a holy man will obey? Is there any word that has just brought to our notice a holy woman? Well, promptly, very quickly, obey the word of God. And you will not willingly, wholeheartedly, without question. And without protecting any personal opinion, such a person is faithful in all duties, commanded by God, and is faithful in all relations in life. He will obey the commandment of giving husband. If he is a husband, a holy person will be a good husband. A person that is holy will be obedient to the commandments given to wives. If that person is a wife, will be a good wife. If he is a parent, he will obey the commandments that are given to parents, and thereby he becomes a good parent. If he is a child, he will obey the commandments given to children. If he's a master or a servant, he will be obedient to the commandments given to masters or servants. What are we saying? A person that is a holy child of God will be a good husband, a good wife, a good parent, a good child, a good master, a good servant. In fact, he's a good friend. He knows how to obey the word of God. And there is love, there is obedience. There is humility in his relationship with people. He's a good neighbor. He's a good citizen. 
all the commandments that are to be obeyed by good citizens of any country, they will obey. Is good in the place of business, is good in private, is good in public. That's holiness. You have love. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, thy heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Oh, so somebody has holiness of life, well, in that he doesn't have hatred or bitterness, doesn't hold malice against anyone, is just benevolent. That's a nice man, a nice woman, a loving fellow. And his life is full of love towards people. In First John chapter 3, First John chapter 3, verse 16, Hereby perceive with the love of God, because he laid down his life, his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's the love of God. Being able to suffer affliction on behalf of your wife. Able to suffer affliction on behalf of your husband. Not forsaking your husband because there's little trouble. Not forsaking your wife because your wife is sick. And then your eyes are after another woman outside. But that woman you've been living together with when she was healthy, now that she, she's sick, loving her, caring for her, giving everything that you have to care for that woman. And children of God, when they're in trouble, you don't forsake them. We've been working together, living together, fellowshipping together, while everyone is healthy, now that someone is sick, we rally around one another. That's holiness. The love of God in the heart. And this love also touches other people around. Verse 17. But he sought this world's good, and seeth his brother had need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? My children, little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue only, but in deed and in truth. Holiness is the habit of being of one mind with God. Agreeing with God in all these decisions, loving what he loves, hating what he hates, measuring everything that you say or do by the standard of God's word. And if there is holiness in our hearts, we'll be full of love, we'll be full of charity, we'll be full of brotherly kindness. The golden rule will be observed in your speech, doing unto others as you want them to do unto you, saying about others what you want them to say of you. Then you'll be full of affection towards the brethren. You cannot easily separate yourself from the children of God. You'll be merciful, you'll be benevolent. Such a man or woman cannot do harm. Only good can he do to his neighbors. He hates all lying, all slandering, all backbiting. Because anybody that lies or slanders or backbites is injuring his neighbor. And a person of love cannot injure anybody. He hates backbiting. He hates cheating and dishonesty. He hates every unfair dealing, even in the least matter. I told you, it also means innocence. He's innocent of anything that is evil. Psalm 119, verse 3. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. That's innocence. That doesn't mean that since he has been born, that's always been innocent like that. No, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But all the sins have been forgiven. And the sin nature had been taken away. He had been purged. He has no guilt for past sins. They are all covered and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Internal depravity also has been dealt with by the cross of Christ. He walks uprightly before God. He sets his affections entirely on things above. He holds the things of this world with a very loose hand. He lives like one whose treasure is in heaven, passing through this world like a pilgrim traveling home. I told you it also includes newness of life. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 23 and 24. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness 
and true holiness. Means of life. Being like Christ. Putting on Christ. Being conformed unto the image of Christ. That is uh, like a new person now. You'll be forgiving as Christ forgave. You'll be unselfish as Christ pleased not himself. You'll be walking in love as Christ also walked in love. You will be humble as he made himself of no reputation. You will not do your own will because Christ says, I come not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And if you are put on Christ, if you are put on the new man, then you'll be like Christ. And you'll be patient under undeserved insults, yet uncompromising in denouncing sin. You'll not be seeking the praise of men, and you will not let the nearest relative stand between you and God's work. You'll say like Christ, it is my meat to do. The will of my Father is stands for endurance. As I said before, you'll endure the cross with all its shame, all its suffering, all its reproach, all the persecution, all the opposition. Such a man that is holy will bear much, forbear much, overlook much, and be slow to talk of standing for his own right. In Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure hardship. Are there difficulties in your place of work? You say you have holiness, endurance is there. Are there difficulties in your husband's house? You say you have holiness, endurance must be there. Are you experiencing difficulties somewhere? Even in the midst of the children of God, you have some hardship, you have some hardness, then endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In Second Timothy chapter 4, Verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Afflictions, suffering, persecution, opposition. Do not fly at their faces. Do not get angry and abuse and say, I will not take that. Endure affliction. James. Chapter 5. Verse 11. But we count them happy which endure. Eternally, you'll be happy. In the presence of the Lord, you'll be happy. We count them happy, which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. And I've seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Are you going through something? And like Job, it appears the problem has not been solved in time. You will endure. That's part of holiness. Then there will be self-denial, self-control. Denying the affections and the lusts of the flesh, you crucify them. Listen to Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. But I keep my body under. The person that says he is living a holy life has to understand that self denial is part of that holiness. Keep my body under and bring it into subjection. The body may make some demands, keep that body under. Keep it under subjection, lest by any means, when I preach unto others, I make myself a castaway. I told you of separation. Separation from pollution. Separation from defilement. A man that is holy will dread all filthiness, all uncleanness of spirit and of the flesh. He will keep clear of all the sparks of temptation. He will avoid all things that will draw him to sin. He fears displeasing God in anything. At any time, he endeavors to keep away from everything that is evil. And he keeps all the known commandments of God. He follows God with all purity of heart. In Second Corinthians chapter 6, reading verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Wherefore, come up from among them. Be ye separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Touch not the unclean thing. Anything that will defile your conscience. Anything that will make you fall into temptation. Anything that will make you go in the way of evil. 
come out of it. Touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. This is I'll be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord. This, my brothers and sisters, is practical holiness. And God expects that each of us will get grace from Him, whereby we can be righteous, whereby we can be holy. This is the work of God. It is God Himself that can do it. Leviticus chapter 20. Verses 7 and 8. Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy. For I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. For I am the Lord which sanctify you. The grace of God is available this morning. The blood of Jesus is still available this morning. If ye be willing, ye shall eat the good of the land. God is waiting for you. Anything you ask him to do for you, to make you humble, help you to be more obedient, help you to love God and love the brethren, help you to be totally innocent and free from guilt and condemnation, have the newness of life, endure whatever is coming your way, and have self-denial and be separated from every defilement and every pollution of the world, the grace of the Lord is available. He'll make you what you ought to be. Let's rise up and pray. Lord, make me what I ought to be. It was possible for Ezekiel, why not for you? Obadiah was holy and perfect before the Lord, why not you? The Levites were separated and consecrated to the Lord, why not you? Isaiah said, O oh Lord, I need cleansing, I need purging. And the sanctifying fire touched him. And he said, your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. And then the Lord said, Whom shall I send who shall go for us? And he said, Lord, here am I. Why not present yourself before the Lord? O oh Lord, here am I. Noah walked before God, perfect in his generation, just in his generation. And he did everything according to the commandment of the Lord. Why not you? Remember Enoch? He walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Remember Samuel? Not taking any bribe, not defrauding anyone, not being dishonest about anything. Remember Stephen, loving and forgiving. Praying for the people that were persecuting him, having the love of Christ within him. How about you? You and your husband, you and your wife, are you obedient to the commandments that are given to husbands? Obedient to the commandments that are given to wives? Let's be holy.